Hi, and welcome to Rochambeau, the podcast about unique competitions, extraordinary events, and other amazing adventures. I'm Kim, and today we're diving into the Rochambeau archives for something that I'm going to call a timely and terrific episode. It goes back to the very early days of Rochambeau. So, of course, it features my sometimes co-host Ted Ledoux. And I thought this would be a really good episode for today for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, because Ted moved to Colorado on Friday of last week, and this episode slash event takes place in Colorado, actually in a town called Nederland, which is only about three hours away from the town that Ted has settled down in. And that brings me to the second reason why I think this is a good episode to air today, which is it's very timely. This event is coming up on March 13th through 15th. It is consistently on USA Today's top 10 list of cultural festivals in the United States, and it is not to be missed. We're very hopeful since Ted is living so close now that he will go this March and report back to us. So without further ado, today's episode, The Coffin Races at Frozen Dead Guy Days. The Frozen Dead Guy days is famous. There was like this dude who died, and maybe it was Norway. I'm not incredibly uh, familiar with the story. I mean, I know he died up there, and then they, they kept his body frozen on dry ice. Some lady ended up like freezing the dude and shipping it to the U.S. Grandpa was taken back to the United States, put in a tough shed on ice and kept frozen. After that point, if you were someone from Netherlands and you were traveling and could someone would ask you, well, where are you from? Say, I'm from Netherlands, Colorado. The first thing out of their mouth was, isn't that where that frozen dead guy is? And the town got really upset about it and was like, that's not cool. You have to get rid of that. And she was like, whoa, that's not okay. And they were like, oh, you're right. We were being too harsh. Uh, let's have a festival. Well, 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 what do we have here? (laughs) Even for Rochambeau, this one is a little bit odd and macabre. Frozen Dead Guy Days take place each March in a funky little Colorado mountain town named Nederland. Now, normally we like to jump right into the competition, but we think this one warrants a little more backstory. Absolutely. Kim talked to Stephanie Andelman, who oversees everything competitive that takes place at Frozen Dead Guy Days, and she has a real story of the frozen grandpa Bredo, a.k.a. Grandpa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and how he came to what, live, uh, reside, rest on the hills rest. overlooking the town. Yeah, that yeah. sounds about right. Netherland is a different kind of town with a lot of outlaws. And there was an outlaw who came here in the mid 80s, we'll say. And he is from Norway. And he and his grandfather believed in cryogenics. And he was going to school at CU, I believe. And I've heard many stories about him. But he lived here and he was building a house. And I don't know how he paid for it all. But somehow in the in the hills in Netherland, he made a home. And um, his grandfather died. And he went back to Norway and put his grandpa on ice and shipped him here. Now, grandpa had died and had thought, you know, wasn't frozen before he died and wasn't frozen at the time of death. So if you truly believe in cryogenics, it's a little odd. But the legend, the story, the public, they think grandpa was taken back to the United States by his grandson living here, put in a tough shed on ice and kept frozen in the hopes that when the technology advances, that cryogenics can bring you back to life and be healthy, that grandpa and grandson will be reunited and live forever. Oh, my God. But grandpa is still in a tough shed by the house that the grandson built in the hills of Dutherland. And there are ice keepers, those that check to make sure the dry ice is still there. Wow. And is the grandson still a resident or is he gone now? The grandson got um, deported. For not having proper paperwork. Gotcha. So now it's just all up to the ice keepers. Exactly. Can you bring me back to the very first Frozen Dead Guy Days and how you guys decided to have a, a festival around this? I could definitely have you talk to Teresa Warren, who was involved in that first year, but it was before my time. My name is Teresa Crush Warren, and I was president of the Chamber of Commerce and played a part in the origination of the festival and in a roundabout way sort of gave it its name. Well, let's start there. How did that happen? Tell me about the name. Well, it starts before the festival, about eight years before the festival. There uh, was a discovery in town of a man on dry ice in a shed. 
on top of a hill overlooking the town. And we discovered him because his daughter was at a town board meeting uh, trying to get a certificate of occupancy for the house that's built on the same property. And of course, she was denied a, a certificate of occupancy because there was no indoor plumbing, there was no electrician, no electrical, you know, it was very far from being finished. Um, this was a, a house that her son, grandpa's grandson, Trigby, was building, and he had been deported a year earlier. So when she was turned down for her certificate of occupancy, she turned to the woman who was sitting next to her and said, well, but who's going to take care of the dead bodies? Oh, my God. <laughs> and everybody was like, what dead bodies? So there actually were two. There was Grandpa, and then there was a guy named Al that um, Trigvi had made arrangements with the family. Al was from Chicago, and Trigvi had been keeping him on dry ice as well. Family had bought into the whole idea of cry cryonics and being able to bring someone back from being dead to coming back at a time when they could perhaps uh, be unfrozen and have their ailment cured. So that is how... Madeline became famous for the frozen dead guy. That was in 1994. And after that point, if you were someone from Netherland and you were traveling and could someone would ask you, well, where are you from? And you'd say, I'm from Netherland, Colorado. The first thing out of their mouth was, isn't that where that frozen dead guy is? <laughs> so he wasn't so much known as that. He wasn't referred so much as that locally, but everyone had had that experience where you were somewhere else and told people you were from Netherland and it was the first thing people said to you. So when we were, the chamber was trying to come up with a winter festival, but we really had not come up with a name any better than March Madness. And it was already, there's already a March Madness and I don't think we need more than one of them. So I suggested, so why don't we just call it what it is? You know, let's just call it Frozen Dead by Days. And some people were like, oh, we can't do that. And then I'm like, well, yes, we can. I mean, there's a little town here in Colorado called Fruta, Colorado, and they have a festival called Mike the Headless Chicken Days. Because in the 40s, someone went to kill their chicken and didn't get the neck cut low enough. And so this chicken ran around without a head and lived for like two years after no. he had attempted. To... No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, in fact, he was on display in Salt Lake City and you had to pay a quarter to get in to see him. Oh my God. You're killing me. <laughs> he was he made the cover of a life magazine. Oh my God. <laughs> That's amazing. So after I I brought that up, there really was no response against calling a frozen deck I did. So <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. I, I guess I made my point. I think you did. It's ironic that the dead chicken was on Life magazine, huh? <laughs> it is. I believe that is the definition of irony. Yeah. Uh, but what a crazy and amazing backstory. I mean, I don't think it gets any crazier. There is a lot going on there. Right. And there's a lot going on at Frozen Dead Guy Days. There is a frozen salmon toss. And frozen turkey bowling. A polar plunge. A frozen t-shirt contest. A grandpa lookalike contest. A hearse parade. And a really big party called the Royal Blue Ball. Fun. Yep. But we're going to focus on the coffin race. It's been the main event of the Frozen Dead Guy days from year one. Teresa gives us some history on the race. Year one. Absolutely. We came up with the idea that you would have to build your own coffin. There would be six pallbearers, which would be the people that would carry the coffin. And then there would have to be a corpse inside. And we it was an obstacle course. It was in the town park where the playground equipment it still is. And there were rules, like you had to stop and do a Chinese fire drill around the ladder going up to the flag. We would always have snow. The Eldora Mountain Resort would bring snow down so we could build the course. And when, so we used the snow to build like hills that they had to go up and come down, anything to make it like an obstacle course and make people fall. I mean, we, we made it challenging. And it got to the place that it became teams that would compete and they would all come dressed. Like we had the, the fat Elvises where we had the pink socks, <laughs> you know, so that they would have a theme and they would all dress for that theme. And toward the end of my time running the coffin races, uh, we decided to put another requirement on so that the end of the race, 
uh, you got a certain amount of points for writing your epitaphs. They would read the epitaph, and then we let the crowd decide who had the best epitaph. And now you would get like 10 points taken off their time or 10 seconds taken off their time, something like that. So they actually did kill the epitaph part, but the race itself is still alive and well. The festival has grown over the years, but it started out with a great first year with 1,700 people showing up. Since then, it's grown to about 20,000 people each wow. year. Wow. I know it. Let's cut back to Stephanie, who says the coffin race is still the most popular event at Frozen Dead Guy Days. Stop calling me. Well, uh, I guess she doesn't want to talk to us. <laughs> no. So that was just a little bit of a misunderstanding from when we initially called her. And I just couldn't leave it out. But, yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> wait. Great. Quick backstory. When we called her, um, the way that we call people shows up as like unlisted or I don't know, whatever, and call her ID. And I guess she thought we were a telemarketer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for real, let's get back to Stephanie and why the coffin race is still the most popular event. The uh, coffin races has, you know, between five and 10,000 people watching. There's about 20,000 people over the weekend, about 15,000 people on Saturday. And the majority of those people are watching the coffin races. The coffin races have anywhere from 20 to 35 teams of seven people. Uh, the rules uh, sometimes change. Well, they always change year to year because the course changes. There's always undulations, challenges of going up and down, pretty hairy, scary, icy, snowy climb. And then there's always little drills you have to do, like try to fire drill or sit around a bat or get on a swing or do jumping jacks or do a handstand. <laughs> and it's usually the corpse has to come out and perform because they're sitting down the rest of the time and that is when one team can take over another team so the actual course may take teams anywhere from mm, 45 seconds to two and a half minutes and the coffins fall apart and some people fall out and you have to end with your coffin and your team your whole team uh, so there can be some serious carnage that takes place and there are several categories of winners fastest time overall best theme best spirit that is by far the most important category and the key to winning is really well a to have a team that is in sync and they know who the leader is and they're not wasted and they can actually run but it's also how good your coffin is how light it is and how easy it is to carry and you will see um Somebody last year had a barrel, like a wine barrel with their coffin in it, with their corpse in it, and that was just way too heavy for them to run with. Um, I've seen kayaks with strings on it, and that has flipped over, and then the corpse falls out. Um, I have seen, I'm trying to think of the funny ones that you're like, why did you think that would work? But I've seen real coffins being carried. They're too heavy. Oh so it's all in having handles and barely any material, but safe for the corpse. Now that you know what the coffin race is all about, let's get to know some of the competitors. Ben Richardson is a grad student out of Boulder. He is now a three-time competitor and a two-time winner. Indeed. And along the way, he has learned a bit about coffin building and the physical but friendly nature of the race. So I actually made the coffin with my dad and my uncle. Uh, so they were out here for a ski vacation that first year. And uh, we had some downtime and just went to Home Depot. And it's uh, not much of a trade secret at this point. There's a lot of designs similar to, to the one that we were using. And I basically Googled uh, coffin dimensions, <laughs> uh, found some, some light, but what I felt would be sturdy plywood and stuck it together with some uh, some metal fastenings. And one thing that we, we do need to uh, work on is our handle design. That has not been uh, super great. We've had our handles that were wooden dowels break multiple times during the coffin races Ooh. yeah i actually uh i actually got a big uh big a nice big star on, on my side from our first year where a jagged piece of wood uh stabbed me we were not ready for uh for the the physical nature of the competition we our, our first match was against a a team called uh, losing nemo and it was a bunch of older guys uh with a fish tank coffin and uh and they had really bright really uh intricate costumes and uh the first first go you know they were throwing elbows you know shoving and pushing so we just shoved and pushed and uh and 
and fought right back. And, uh, you know, we get to the finish line. They came up to us. They were laughing. They were like, hey, I'm, we're glad you guys were, uh, you know, were right there with us, you know, all good fun, uh, friendly competition. And we were like, okay, cool. This is how this goes. You, uh, <laughs> <laughs> This is a, a very intense physical competition. It's not just a cardio race. Let's step back just a bit and hear how Ben got involved in this unique race of dead men's beds. So I first found out about the coffin races actually on a graduate recruiting visit. Um, We went up to the Frozen Dead Guy Days Festival during my visit and watched a mechanical engineering team by the name of the Pink Sox uh, basically crush all the competition. They had won, I think, uh, six years in a row, and uh, I was just pretty pretty impressed by the fact that... uh, (laughs) It's a one-on-one uh, single elimination tournament uh, where people race through a snowy obstacle course. It was pretty uh, pretty exciting to watch. Actually, uh, another uh, student in the department named Kim, Kim and I were both there, and we said, all right, next year when we're here, we'll start a team. And uh, we did just that. We managed to pull a team together, and we actually uh, we actually won it. We beat the Pink Sox. It was actually the last year they were planning to compete, so it was a little bittersweet. Uh, <laughs> they were proud. They were glad, you know, that that there was an upstart team, uh, but they were also a little bit uh, a little bit saddened that they couldn't keep their perfect uh, record. Our team was actually named the the Grand Canonical Ensemble, which is actually an homage to a terrible graduate thermodynamics class that we all suffered together. But the announcers aptly rebranded us as the nerds because they had no idea what the Grand Canonical Ensemble was or really even how to say it in a race uh, environment. After we got kind of dubbed the nerds, we kind of stuck with it. We we were wearing for our costume the only thing that we all had that was the same, which was lab coats, safety glasses, and ski helmets. I think it works as a costume because the white lab coats really display all the mud and everything that gets sprayed up from trying to sprint through this slushy, wet obstacle course. There's been some pretty epic crashes, actually. Uh, one of which was, was our team. Uh, last year, we weren't able to repeat our uh, our victory. We were knocked out before the quarterfinals. We had a, a pretty spectacular crash that actually made uh, made it onto the Denver Post. Oh, but what happened? <laughs> uh, so, so they've actually started including more more things for the coffin rider to do, the corpse. So, our first year there was like a hula hoop thing. Um, this last year there was a dizzy bat, and then you had to balance across a log. Um, um, I'm sorry, can you explain that? Yeah, as you're racing, uh, so the first year as you're racing, you had to put down the coffin. Your corpse has to jump out. Hula hoop, I think maybe it was like five times or something, and then hop back in, and they pick up the coffin, keep going, and then you get to a second stop point where you have to put the coffin back down, and all of the pallbearers have to do a circle. So they have to go all the way around the coffin and then pick it back up and keep running. And then this last year, there was a similar thing, only the coffin, the corpse needed to do a dizzy bat and then balance across a log that was... Uh, elevated just a couple feet off the ground, um, but there's mud and slush on the course and in and around it, so it's quite slick. And uh, our coffin rider, Kim, was actually sick at the time and uh, had had been heavily uh, medicating with cough syrup, so her balance was uh, was pretty impaired, and she was really struggling with that. And we, uh, we originally, uh, the first couple races, uh, kind of compensated for it pretty well but the the race that we got knocked out in we were really far behind because of that and we tried to take a shortcut through uh, about two feet of water (laughs) and uh the force actually that we went in you know because we were running full sprint into the the knee knee high water uh really uh kind of i actually i think it was me really i gotta take credit for uh for our failure there but i slipped and uh the handle actually broke in my hands um and uh and basically kind of dominoed my my coffin and we crashed 
We talked to Ben before this year's race. Frozen Dead Guy Days takes place every year in early March. And we are happy to announce that the nerds were victorious. Woohoo! Yep, they won the 2018 Coffin Race. Well done, nerds! Indeed, congratulations. Um, I get the impression that our next competitor, Sean, is probably not a nerd. Maybe not. His team, Top Guns, took third place in last year's 2017 race. My name's Sean Abel. I was a uh, contestant last year in the um, coffin race. We uh, took third place. What was the theme of your team? So our team, we were called Top Guns, and uh, a, f- a few were kind of, we had a, a fighter pilot um, jumpsuit on the girl who was in the coffin, mm-hmm. and we uh, kind of painted the coffin to look like uh, a jet then all the guys were just the guys carrying were just uh everyone kind of went with their own thing i was like uh lumberjack we had a cowboy um another guy who was you know uh cut off jean shorts um <laughs> aviators all that stuff so, so you're sure it wasn't a ymc <clears throat> theme yeah <laughs> well, that's what we kind of looked like in the end <laughs> what what got you guys into doing this i don't know i'd heard of the festival a few years and uh went out and watched it the year before and was mm-hmm. just you know thought it was like really cool and a fun idea um so i like passed across a couple friends thought if anyone was interested and we just threw a team together and, and did it do you do any certain preparation for the event no i mean we we put the coffin together um we uh you know, picked it up a couple times in the parking lot last year, <laughs> ran back and forth a few times and caught it good. Had had a beer and waited for the race. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think this year you have a chance to get first or second? I think so. Yeah. I think so. We got a good team. Yep. We uh, learned a lot from last year. So, I mean, we're still not going to practice, but it'll still, we'll, we'll do well. <laughs> we'll do all right. What, what did you learn uh, from last year? Uh, just keep moving. Uh, try to go fast, but don't uh, overexert. We went <laughs> first race. We, we came out, tried to sprint as fast as we could and went right down in the mud pit, dropped the casket, like the uh-huh. corpse fell out and we were, <laughs> you know days but eventually we got back up and we were actually able to win the race but Uh i think this one we need to uh everyone needs to drink a lot of water and keep loose um (laughs) so we had one of our teammates was like puking last year he wasn't in shape for it so i think i think we i told him he needs to go for a jog or something you know this week (laughs) get get loosened up I mean, it's it's an awesome festival. Everyone's so cool. Joking around before the race, joking around during the race. You know, everyone's just, just there to have a good time. Nobody takes it too seriously. Well, all that lack of preparation seems to have really paid off this year, as the Top Guns did not get first or second <laughs> or even third. Oh, gosh. But I am assuming they did have a good time. Of course they did. Yeah. And speaking of a good time, our final competitor, Sam, and her crew sure know how to have one, as her team name Party Animals might just imply. Mm-hmm. We all just happen to have animal onesies in our costume boxes, so <laughs> that's kind of where where it went, and we were celebrating my birthday, so party animal. Wow! My name is uh, Sam, uh, Sam Chen, formality-wise, and I am a coffin race participant um, of fun. Well, we, uh, let's just say we came very unprepared compared to most of the other teams. Didn't realize that the competition was was fierce. Wow! Um, (laughs) I guess there have been some people who've been coming for a long while there uh, and have, you know, been designing their ships or their coffins, that's what I mean, uh, for a while. We uh, picked up ours in the back of an alley, which was a cardboard box. (laughs) <laughs> and makeshifted it the, the day prior. Um, we won most spirited because we set off and we were probably the slowest of all the groups. So in reaction to that, there was this big mud puddle uh, towards the very end. And I was like, you know what? There is really no way we are going to make it to the next round. So I released the coffin and I went full full speed uh, right into uh, the mud puddle um, in a white cow onesie. <gasps> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, I just went for it, uh, you know? Uh, so it was, it was a, it was a good time. And I, I guess that, that impressed the mayor and uh, we got most spirited. That's awesome. So did your, did your nosedive in the mud pit, did the coffin fall? Like, did it, 
throw off the weight of the balance of everybody else holding it? Let's be honest. I'm the smallest person. <laughs> Was I of use to the coffin race? Probably not. <laughs> I actually really can't wait to go again this year. Uh, it's just, it's so fun. It's so different than any other festival, quote unquote, I've ever been to. So um, I, I think I'm going to start making a regular thing for my birthday. What a great way to celebrate a birthday. No doubt. So at the top of this episode, we played a couple of theories on how the actual frozen dead guy, Grandpa, got to be there. Well, Sam's got her own version of the story. The frozen dead guy days uh, is famous, um, at least in Colorado. Um, it's it's famous in, it, in its most obscure way, right? From what I understand, there was, and this is just, I think it was a Wikipedia that I'd read maybe a year ago, so I could be off. But I think there was like this dude who died in, in maybe it was Norway. I can't remember. And then I, I think it was like the sister or the aunt or some lady ended up like freezing the dude and shipping it with her to the U.S. where she landed in Ned or somewhere around Ned and kept this dude frozen in her house or in her shed. Can't I don't remember. The authorities caught wind of it or something like that and, like, I don't know, shut down her operation. And But for whatever reason, I don't know, Ned's weird, right? Uh, they kept the dude. Uh, <laughs> frozen and then put them in the shed <laughs> and when you're as small as Ned and as weird as Ned like we're the city who is the frozen dead guy why not have a celebration about having a dude who's frozen in your city I love Sam she is awesome but I have to tell you when she talked to us she did say she had one condition uh don't tell anybody about it <laughs> you know the thing can only stay as weird for so long don't tell anybody it's it's too much fun to to get too popular Ah, uh, I agree. That sounds too good to share. Agreed. So we won't tell, right? right? You guys out there in listener land, you can keep this under your hat. Shh. Yeah. <laughs> but since you guys already know, it's cool if you go visit. In fact, you can still go to Netherland and Grandpa Bredo is still up there on ice. Thanks in part to the original ice keeper, Bo the Iceman Schaefer. Hi, my name is Bo Schaefer. I have uh, was caretaker for Grandpa Brito for about 18 years. I uh, helped start the Frozen Dead Guy Festival and um, took care of a cryonic facility uh, along with my company and, my, and myself. We took care of a cryonic facility for um, almost 18 years. Basically, it started out being just transporting dry ice to this facility up in the mountains. Um, it varied. He, all, he wanted it for th every three weeks at first, which was ridiculous. After a few years, we got it down to once a month. And what we'd, we'd take up about 1,500 pounds of dry ice. Then we started the festival and did tours and did a whole bunch of stuff afterwards. Started up the a uh, International Cryonics Institute. And is that something that you were interested in already on your own, or was it all inspired by taking care of Grandpa? Well, as a scientist, I mean, I, I was, I, especially as a biological scientist, I was actually aware of some things that a lot of people aren't aware of, like the fact that we have frozen critters and thawed them out, and they're fine. You well, have personally don't. done that? No, I've, I've, I've read the research. Sure. I mean, I, I know about the research. There has, there has been cry, cryonic research done on uh, certain turtles and uh, frogs, and they ain't got much bigger than that, but because these things normally hibernate and can freeze and wake up and be fine. Well, they took a couple of them. They took a turtle in particular and froze his butt and kept him there for three or four months, thawed him out, and he seemed to crawl away fine. But, of course, he couldn't really fill out a form or anything, so he didn't really know for sure. Bo is a character, and we do love characters. They're what make this whole thing happen. Truth. Yeah. And if you guys are keen on going to Frozen Dead Guy Days, it always takes place in Nederland, Colorado, in March. You can learn the exact dates and location at their website, frozendeadguydays.org. And of course, all of this and more will be on our site, RochambeauPodcast.com. As always, we have to give a big shout out to everyone who generously shared their time and stories with us. Thank you, Stephanie, Teresa, Ben, Sean, Sam, and Bo. Thank you, guys. And Ned. Yes, thank you, Ned, for existing. All the music you hear on this podcast is courtesy of Atlanta jazz funk legends Cadillac Jones. If you're not familiar with them, you should be. Find them at CadillacJones.com and on Facebook and other outlets, I'm sure. Guys, thank you so much for listening. When you have a minute, please subscribe to the podcast if you're enjoying it. And if you're inclined, we would love it if you would post a review. It's really the best way for us to get the word out about Rochambeau. Till next time, people. Goodbye.
Where's my roar? <laughs> Want my wildcat? Wow. Wow. Wow.